Thank you for joining today's LGBTQ plus roundtable. My name is Ishelle Rosal, and I have the honor of serving as the Associate Vice President for Student Life. This event is part of University Life's Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement, which promotes Columbia's commitment to diversity and the success of all graduate and professional school students. And it is co-sponsored by the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, which recently published the Columbia University LGBTQ Plus Guide, Resources to Foster an Affirming Community for LGBTQ Plus Faculty, Students, and Staff. We'll talk more about the guide later in today's program. At University Life, we often talk about the university as community. There is strength in coming together and sharing information and resources as well as camaraderie. Things we always need, but particularly in this moment. This event will hopefully reinforce that you belong here and have access to a community that supports and cares about you. As Vice Provost Mitchell has stated recently, an environment affirming of diversity in gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation is essential at Columbia. Before I turn it over to our esteemed panelists, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this program will be recorded so that we can share it later via University Life's YouTube channel. This will allow students in various time zones to view the program at a later date. If you have any questions about this recording, please contact our office at universitylife@columbia.edu. Also, please make sure to remain muted. Towards the end of the workshop, there'll be an opportunity for questions. We ask that you type your questions into the chat box so we can answer as many as possible. We also recommend that you keep your view on speaker view versus gallery view. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Please note, these are abbreviated bios. Each of our panelists have achieved tremendous accomplishments and I encourage you to research their full bios after today's event. First up is Professor Walter Bakhting. Dr. Bakhting is a clinical psychologist and co-director of the Initiative for LGBT Health at the New York State Psychiatric Institute within, Columbia, within the Columbia School of Nursing. His research interests are LGBT health, sexual and gender identity development, internet research methods, HIV prevention, and the promotion of sexual health. His research has been funded by the American Foundation for AIDS Research and the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Bakhting is an, is, in a, is an internationally known expert in the assessment and treatment of gender dysphoria, as well as in general mental health and psychosocial adjustments of transsexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming children, adolescents, adults, and their families. He is widely published and is the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Transgenderism. Dr. Bakhting is past president of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health and a past president and fellow of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. Dr. Bakhting's work at CUIMC focuses on combining research, clinical practice, education, and public policy to promote LGBT health locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Next is Professor Brian Smith. Professor Smith is an assistant professor at Columbia University's Department of Computer Science, where he directs the Computer Enabled Abilities Lab, also known as SEAL. Brian's students and he develop computers that can grant people new abilities, abilities that help people better experience the world. His research is interdisciplinary and incorporates accessibility, games, AR, AI, sensing, and vision. He is also a research scientist at SNAP Research, where he develops new concepts in human computer interactions, HCI, social computing, games, and augmented reality. He is a member of SNAP's HCI research team and works closely with SNAP Lab, SNAP's hardware division and the team behind Spectacles. Next up is Professor Tiffany Thomas. Dr. Thomas is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Cell Biology. She is the director of the New York Presbyterian Hospital Biomedical Genetics Laboratory. The laboratory performs metabolic profile testing for patients with suspected metabolic diseases, including inborn errors of metabolism, as well as acquired metabolic disorders. 
In addition to Dr. Thomas's clinical responsibilities, she is a member of the Institute of Human Nutrition teaching faculty. And lastly, our moderator for today, Professor Patrick Wilson. Dr. Wilson is an associate professor and director of the Sphere Lab at Columbia University, which stands for Society, Psychology, and Health Research. Dr. Wilson earned his PhD in community psychology from New York University and completed an NIMH postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University. In addition to teaching at Mailman School of Public Health, Dr. Wilson specializes in exploring the psychological, social, and cultural context that shape individual and community level health outcomes. He conducts his work with the overall goal of improving the lives of those who are disproportionately affected by HIV and other health disparities. Dr. Wilson's recent work includes examining institutional and community responses to the HIV AIDS epidemic, designing and testing culturally appropriate behavior change interventions, developing novel technology-based methods for investigating health behaviors, and increasing cultural relevance in HIV AIDS research. Specific topics of interest also include trauma, stigma, and discrimination, religion, engagement in care and personal factors, including self-efficacy and empowerment. Dr. Wilson holds membership in several research centers and networks within and outside of Columbia University and conducts national and local studies that involve the partnership of a diverse set of collaborators and community members. His research is supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health and the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Please welcome all of our panelists and our moderator. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Wilson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And um, thanks to the Office of University Life um, for holding this event, this important event um, that is really, I hope to be as interactive as, as we can make it, uh, not of course being in the same physical space, uh, but certainly wanting to make this as dynamic a round table as, as, as possible. Um, Ishelle did a great job, I think, uh, introducing us uh, and talking a little bit about some of the, the work we do. Um, so I'll just say very quickly about myself. I've been at Columbia for uh, 15 years now and have been in the Department of Social Medical Sciences at the School of Public Health for that time. And have also been involved um, in, uh, as many of the panelists, um, working towards uh, uh, developing a, a, an even improved environment um, for LGBTQ uh, plus students, staff, and faculty um, here at Columbia. And there are so many resources that are available but also so many experiences that uh, I think we can draw upon and um, use to help shape and guide um, our path as we move forward in our careers, uh, regardless of, of, of where that path takes us. Um, so I was really hoping that um, our panelists, as they talk about some of their background um, and experiences can um, sort of help us uh, understand the path that they uh, took um, to get to where they are um, and talk about maybe some of the ups and downs and the ways that they've navigated um, academia and their specific disciplines um, in relation to LGBTQ and other identities. Uh, I think that's another important aspect of this is that we know that we all um, uh, carry with us uh, different identities, different um, uh, orientations uh, and to be able to talk about uh, exactly how that has uh, shaped some of our experiences um, is, is, is hopefully what we'll be able to talk about. So as I, I toss this over to uh, our panelists to, to um, share a little bit about, you know, what got them to where they are, I hope that all of you will start thinking of some questions um, that you have um, or experiences and insights that you'd like to share um, so that we can have a pretty robust conversation um, uh, for
for the time that we have together. So I thought I would just, um, again, ask our panelists first to maybe talk a little bit about themselves and, and focus that on, on how they got to where they are. Um, and I, I was just gonna go in alphabetical order uh, and start with uh, Walter, if I could. Um, so Walter, if you wouldn't mind sharing. I can, and uh, hi to everyone. Uh, well, I'm originally from the Netherlands, and uh, it started with me really, well, I could say at birth, but really when I was 13, I remember being in class in high school, and the teacher asked what we want, we had to write down on a note what we wanted to do when we grow up. And I put down sex researcher already at that time, but, and then the teacher reached out and called on several of us and called on me and I blushed and I thought, oh my God, am I gonna say this for the whole class? And I didn't, I said, psychologist. And that's exactly what I did. So I really, after graduating from high school, I went to college and university and majored in psychology and clinical psychology. And then during my clinical psychology program is when I really sought out the training and I had to go to another university at the time in gender and sexuality. And then when I uh, graduated, I had the opportunity to go uh, to the United States for a postdoctoral fellowship at the human sexuality program at the University of Minnesota. And when I was there, there was another faculty member that uh, directed the transgender program there and she went on sabbatical. So almost immediately they asked me to step in and work with the patients and uh, further the research in that particular area. So even though I was very broadly trained, I really, once I got into that postdoc, really got very involved and engaged in working with transgender uh, and what we now call some non-binary communities. And then I came to Columbia uh, nine years ago, specifically to co-lead the program for the study of LGBT health, which is a joint venture in psychiatry and nursing. And that was a great opportunity for me to take my experience to Columbia, which has such rich resources in terms of research that I really wanted to bring to help us understand uh, gender and sexual identity development across the lifespan and that's the work that I do now. And then lastly, I had the opportunity with the uh, Vice Provost Office of Faculty Advancement to work with Adina and uh, Jen who are both on the, on the call here to lead an effort to develop the LGBTQ resource guide that we just launched. And uh, you can find it on the website of the Provost Office. And uh, maybe we can talk about it more later as well. And many of you were involved, you know, including Patrick. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. And I do hope that we can talk about the LGBTQ resource guide because I think it's obviously a humongous uh, resource for everybody. Uh, uh, and will direct, I think, a lot of, of, of what we can um, expect in terms of the atmosphere and what we're doing at, at Columbia. So I thought I could now ask um, Professor Smith, uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, opening up a little bit and uh, telling us about how you got to where you are. Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, so yeah, so yeah, my name is Brian Smith and I, um, in my, in, I'm currently in my second year as a professor in the computer science department. Um, I've been at Columbia for a long time. Uh, I did my, Adina knows this, um, I, did, I did my undergrad here at Columbia. Uh, I went to grad school, got my master's and my PhD here at Columbia. And now I, um, uh, I, I'm a professor here. Um, and so while I don't do uh, LGBTQ related research or, or psychology uh, research um, for that matter, I can speak uh, about my experiences at Columbia as a student as an undergraduate student, as a grad student, as a faculty member. Um, so super interested in hearing, hearing your questions actually uh, later on. Um, ultimately, I think if I were to, to summarize, offer like just a high level summary of my story, I would say, um, looking back, I think a lot of my growth as um, just in terms of my career um, and in, in terms of, as, of being a researcher was about, um, 
uh, was almost about overcoming imposter syndrome. Um, and I say that in all senses of the word, right? Am, am I cut out for research? Um, do, you know, can I fit in with this community? Do I even like this kind of work as much as other people who are doing, you know, this research? All of those questions. And, and identity plays a big part of that. Um, uh, intersectionality is real, um, you know, and so there were, uh, I guess, um, when it came to uh, being comfortable with, uh, you know, going and, and doing my own thing, uh, I had to uh, rectify that with, uh, mul you know, with multiple identities in my case, um, uh, being LGBTQ, uh, you know, being black, um, coming, being a first generation college student, uh, all of the above. Um, and so I could relate to, you know, to each of those communities on campus. Um, and then there were things, aspects of each of those communities that I couldn't relate to due to, you know, some of my other identities, uh, right? So for a, a lot of student organizations, um, you know, for example, uh, like NSBE, National Society of, of Black um, Engineers, right? Um, uh, not a lot of, you know, not a lot of out uh, gay or LGBTQ members. Um, similar thing for a lot of the uh, LGBTQ focused student organizations, um, you know, not a lot of ethnic diversity there. Uh, and so finding a place when, you know, uh, that um, in which uh, I, I could see myself fitting in, in, you know, in a, in a full sense uh, became difficult. Fast forward to today, um, you know, as, as a faculty member, I, you know, one of the things that I really love about, uh, about uh, being a professor is getting to cultivate and grow uh, people. Uh, to identify people uh, who um, uh, can do great things in the world and to do whatever I can to help them blossom. Uh, that's a huge part of the job. And I think from a student's perspective, a lot of, um, of going through college, of going through graduate school is not only becoming better academically or learning more academically, but it's also about figuring out what, you, what your life is going to be. Uh, it's more than academics. Uh, it's about the full picture. Where do I see myself living and what kind of jobs do I think I'm interested in? Where would I want to work and like, uh, you know, what kind of partner, uh, you know, what kind of person do I want to date? Like all of those questions actually factor in to what you're learning and um, testing out um, uh, while you're in uh, college and graduate school, etc. Uh, and so I think a big part of that, a, a big part of the struggle that I had looping back to imposter syndrome was figuring out how all of those pieces would work together and how, um, how maybe in my case, those pieces would feed off of each other, uh, right? Um, and yeah, and so, so for example, like, you know, I'll, I'll just say one more thing and, and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pass it on and, and hope to get questions. But um, uh, a lot of, at least in graduate school, um, a lot of what I remember thinking at the time was like, oh, wow, I'm a PhD student now. Like, clearly, like, there are people who believe in me in terms of research potential. And clearly, you know, um, uh, at least with, with, with respect to my advisor, um, I, you know, my advisor sees similarities between uh, him and me uh, in my case, right? Like we have certain tastes in how we like to give talks in, in how we uh, like to think about research, you know, all of that sort of stuff, right? We clicked in a lot of ways. And I feel a lot of research, at least when it comes to, to research is figuring out how you're going to click with the research community. Um, and for me at the time, there was a lot of, um, you know, I would worry about this, which is, uh, you know, if I were to, uh, you know, this was early on in my PhD, like if I were to start talking about my personal life, for example, with my advisor, like, is that going to interfere with how similar my advisor views me to him? Um, is that going to change the dynamic there uh, in terms of that in terms of that click? And same with uh, lab mates and stuff. And so that was something that took me a little while to uh, to navigate over the course of my PhD. Um, but that was closely related to imposter syndrome in general as part of graduate school. Um, we I think part of graduate school is like 
uh, is working through all of those issues um, as far as defining, uh, you know, what you want your life to be and how, uh, how you're going to tell your story. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Smith, for, for sharing. And I think you, you, you touched on so many topics that I, I really hope we can, we can get to. And I feel like there was so much fodder there for questions and insights. So I wanna encourage everyone as um, we move on to please uh, continue to think about those questions. And if you have one, go ahead and type it into the chat. Uh, because we'll be ready to to look at those questions and answer them uh, as we move forward. But I do want to now ask uh, Professor Thomas if, if you could uh, share a little bit about about your journey to where you where you are right now. Hey everybody! So I grew up in the eighties and nineties in Northern California, and never thought that I was going to become a biochemist. I actually thought that I was going to become a lawyer, and just because my uncle was a lawyer and I liked his lifestyle, and I thought that, that was going to be amazing. Went to undergrad at UC Davis and decided that I hated political science, but quickly decided that I liked nutrition and was pretty okay at it. And so finished that, went to Berkeley and studied also nutrition. At the time it was human nutrition, but they decided that people were having a hard time getting jobs in nutrition because what do you do with a degree in nutrition? So they rebranded it molecular and biochemical nutrition, which sounds sexy because it has molecular in it and biochemistry in it. And that was the first time that I moved away from my family. And all of a sudden was able to figure out who I was as a person, who I wanted to be as a person. And it was a strange time because that was now in the 2000s. It's still transsexual was not, I think, common as it is now and there really wasn't the language and the framework for discussing it and so coming out as a transgender female was scary it was stigmatized I dealt with a lot of issues within my research environment and so you know trying to figure out how to navigate that how to handle a power dynamic with other professors where you'd get comments like one of the professors said, if I saw somebody that was dressed like you growing up, I would beat the crap out of you. That's tough. So, you know, what do you do with that? And then you know, try to navigate the healthcare system in the early 2000s, even in San Francisco, it was tough. I went to, fortunately, San Francisco had a clinic, and I think they still do at the time, where they were able to provide healthcare for me. And so I was very lucky you know, that at least I had a couple people that were able to support me, including my family, which stood by me. I wasn't sure, like a lot of kids, that they would stand by me, but they did. And they took out a second mortgage on their home to pay for a lot of my surgeries. They went to all five of my surgeries and waited for me to recover, which is amazing. I decided to do my postdoc postdoctoral training in New York because it was far away. I also liked the research and I liked who I was working with, but it was also for me a fresh start. Turned out that it wasn't as much of a fresh start as I thought. My previous mentor called the new PI to let him know that I was transgender and just wanted to let him know just in case he didn't, in case I didn't share that with him, that this is something that he needs to be aware of. So it was not his story to share, but Nevertheless, I was also lucky that Henry Ginsburg was very supportive of me and let me live my life and gave me opportunities and stayed on a couple of years after that got clinical training. And that's when I decided that I was really interested in integrating biochemistry with a clinical role. So that's where I ended up becoming the director of the Biochemical Genetics Laboratory where we diagnose kids with inborn errors and metabolism. And I do research on the nutritional effectors of blood quality, which is really cool. But you know, the thing that I'm most passionate about is this growing and fostering of the people that are coming up now and making sure that they, everybody has a visible role model to know that you can be lesbian, you can be gay, you can be bisexual, you can be transgender, 
you're going to be okay. You want to be an academic, you can be that. I didn't have that growing up. And I think that was one of the rate limiting steps for me coming out in the first place that I was not sure that I was going to be okay. Even though I didn't have a role model, I wasn't sure that I was going to be okay. I did it anyway, because I was to the point where I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to live my life that way anyway. But I was very fortunate to all of a sudden have these books. One of them was by Jenny Boylan, who's now my uh, downstairs neighbor, which is amazing. But all of a sudden there was an academic social science, so different field, but nevertheless, to have somebody that is an academic transition and she's okay, made the world to me. And so if I can be that to even one other person, that's what I'd like to do. Thank you so much, Professor Thomas. So, I mean, there's so much here that our three panelists have provided. And again, just, I see a couple of questions coming in and uh, please keep them coming. There's one thing I wanted to touch upon that, that each of you um, uh, sort of alluded to and um, that our first sort of question comment uh, talks about, which is uh, mentorship. But I've wanted to frame it in, in this way because you each um, are leaders um, and, and play leadership roles, whether it's in your lab, uh, in your center. And I'm wondering the, what role did mentorship play in you getting there? And as leaders and managers, um, uh, because again, this was alluded to, how do you work with uh, uh, the, your colleagues, with um, others um, and, how does that intersect with your identity or does it? Um, how do you mentor other uh, faculty, students, um, advisees? Um, so I don't know if, if, if I should call on someone or if somebody uh, already knows exactly what they'd like to say in response to that. Um, I will let someone jump in and if I don't hear something in a, two seconds, I'll, I'll call. I see Walter unmuted yourself. Somewhere. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we, we've already talked about it, but I think mentorship, I would say is everything. You know, I think that's how I really engaged with the work. That's, I, I met my mentor, my first mentor in the Netherlands when he was visiting and he gave me that opportunity to come to Minnesota. And when I came to Colombia as well, I actually sought out Colombia and sought out a mentor, Anke Ehrhardt that I wanted to, uh, to work with. And I think in my own work, when I think about what am I most proud of and, and what ultimately gives me the most fulfillment is really where my mentees have gone. So I think it's very important. I could relate to a lot of what Brian was saying, that click, but also, you know, you, you can, I learn from my mentees, but also we, it can just be so meaningful to share the experiences and help people through their struggles. Um, and, and I think most of all, help people um, or encourage people, support people in going for their passion, follow their passion, follow their ideas. I think this morning I met with a mentee and uh, you know, he sort of had all these questions, well, maybe I won't be able to get a job in this, or maybe is this really a fundable idea and this seems too difficult. And, and I said, you have to go for your passion and your idea. And I, I like your idea, it's doable. And uh, I think then the rest will, will follow. And I was able then to share an example of my own career when I had that point, when I had these questions, when I wondered whether transgender health research was fundable by the NIH and how I mentioned to get one of the first grants in the, in the early uh, 2000s. So I think those relationships are just uh, key and are, are so rewarding. Thank you so much, Walter. Others, uh, Professor Thomas or Smith? I echo what Dr. Bakhtin said, you know, I would not be where I am right now without having a mentor who's willing to walk with me and to write grants with me and to believe in me when I don't believe in myself and say, you're going to be okay. Even though you didn't get this grant, you'll get the next one. And we're going to write other papers together. This experiment didn't work, but you're going to be okay. And it goes the other way where I have students 
and the students' experiments don't work, and or they're just having a hard time in life, and you get to walk with them and remind them that there's so many different facets of life that include academia, and you only get one chance at doing life to make sure that they make the most out of it. Thank yeah, and I'll, I'll just say one thing about mentors, which I, I often say um, is uh, I've learned to, um, to, uh, to, so I've learned that the, the term mentor is overloaded. Um, and because there are often many different things that, um, that one might uh, hope to get from a, pers a prospective mentor, from just um, learning more about the craft, um, right? About the, about the business, whatever business that might be, um, maybe just like networking with more colleagues um, and, and uh, connecting, connecting you with others, um, helping like being your advocate just in general. Uh, maybe they don't know so much about the research, but they know about you. They know about your temperament, um, getting you to stick to deadlines. You know, like, did you do that yet? That, you know, that person. Um, these don't have to be the same person. They can be different people. Um, and so I found it very useful for me to understand, you know, on a more fine grained level, what are these pieces that I, that I really think uh, I need to uh, carry me forward. Even today, I need that person that says, did you do that? Did you start writing that grant? No, did you really start writing that grant? Um, I need that. Um, I, I'll probably need that for life. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I form a plan where like, okay, this person will be my mentor for that. And these people will be my mentor for that. It doesn't always have to be one person. That used to be a blocker for me. Um, Absolutely. I think multiple mentors across different domains or in multiple domains is, 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 is key, uh, regardless of where you are, mid or, or junior faculty, mid-career senior, um, or a student. Uh, I wanted to, you guys have each alluded to sort of opening doors, but uh, I, I did want to ensure that all the comments around that have been noted. But I also wanted to um, ask the question about finding and identifying colleagues that are LGBTQ. Um, that is another question that was posed and i um, wondering if any of you uh, can speak to that. And I, I'm, I'm notably interested in, in Dr. Thomas and Dr. Smith uh, being in professions that are not necessarily focused on, on LGBTQ specific issues. So I found when I was a postdoc and a grad student, that was a lot easier and it was more straightforward because they were already established. And when they weren't established when I first came, I helped to establish them. And so I think that part of me working towards that was to, to find friends because I was new. And I think the spice of life and being able to move forward is having friends and to be able to walk with somebody else. As a faculty member, I think it's tougher. I think that we're moving a little more in the right direction with having uh, an LGBT specific faculty group. And I think that that all of a sudden opens up a lot of opportunities, even if they're not in the same um, specific area, they're not in biochemistry, they're not in the sciences, they're in the social sciences. You know, we're still navigating the same system and speak in a similar language, and that's been really helpful. And so I hope, that, I hope that that continues to flourish. Yeah, I, I, I concur in terms of, um, especially as, as a, a faculty member um, outside, right, in the sciences doing something totally different. Um, these, uh, you know, th those types of, you know, affinity groups just don't, don't really exist. Um, more are starting to pop up around like big conferences. Um, but outside of that, they're not really there. Um, and so that's, I guess that, that sort of responsibility rests on, on us to, to um, you know, open up those opportunities for, for next generation. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to now ask about a, a couple of questions and that's uh, again, sort of navigating the workplace and notably decisions around disclosure and coming out, um, how you've navigated that, um, who you made decisions to, 
uh, come out to who you've made decisions not to. Um, and your experiences around that, if, if you wouldn't mind talking to, to that. I can say that for me, I mean, I was always, I think, out um, and I don't, didn't feel that I necessarily had to disclose that. I think that it quickly people get acclimated and, and it becomes clear, I think, that, that I identify as, as gay. But I do remember that I was discouraged from bringing my personal experience or my, I could only bring so much of my knowledge my personal knowledge of the LGBTQ community and experiences into my work. So I remember really preparing for a talk and my mentor edited it and said that I should tone down sharing, you know, how I grew up and that part of the, of the story. I was a very uh, feminine boy growing up and that is part of, I think, what inspired me and what drove some of the ideas that I was studying. So I came to a point in my career that I wanted to talk about that and talk about what inspired me, but I really was, got a lot of pressure at the time to not do that because I was told that it would compromise my credibility. But mind you, you know, I'm a little older than the other, <laughs> the other colleagues here. I think things have changed, maybe not in every setting, but I think that, that there has been a change and that that is more commonplace and more accepted and I think understood that sometimes that is just really important and effective in terms of uh, uh, sharing what you're about and helping people understand the importance of the questions that you're pursuing in your research. Yeah, I would say there's, and, and even today, I would say there, um, you know, from everything that I hear, there's a, there's a difference between, um, uh, you know, coming out and being, um, and, and I guess like uh, interleaving your LGBT identity, um, LGBTQ identity with uh, research um, in the area, if you do research in the area, compared to if you don't. Whereas there's still, I hear um, at least, you know, some people who are doing research in LGBTQ uh, issues, who also identify as LGBTQ uh, can, uh, can encounter credibility um, issues even to this day. I never felt that um, being in science and being in a very different type of science. Um, but what I did feel was that, um, was a sense that, uh, you know, there, there's nothing really to gain um, with, with, you know, with being out because it doesn't relate to my research or my day-to-day -day work at all. I, I felt that certainly as a graduate student. Um, there's, there are times when, right, and labs are small. Um, and so I, you know, sometimes I had, you know, two lab mates, you know, three lab mates, that sort of thing. Um, they would rotate. And then there's also a, sometimes you get a sense of, um, you know, people talk about uh, their personal lives all the time. Um, and, but like sometimes uh, it felt, I'm thinking back to like when I was in grad school, it would feel like if I, you know, shared certain aspects of my personal life, then the risk, the, you know, my colleagues uh, on the other end would think like, oh, wow, he's sharing a lot. Um, right. Like they're just talking about what happened in their weekend. And it's sometimes it feels like if you do identify as LGBTQ, uh, just sharing those same things feels like you're sharing so much more. Um, so I got a sense of that. Um, I also think that, um, uh, so what else, what else was I going to say? Um, I guess those, those were the main things. Yeah. But I, I think like, I feel that, uh, today, um, things are a lot easier, uh, just in terms of like ha having been on the other side, um, you know, at least, you know, with other professors and other faculty member and stuff, I wouldn't have believed seven years ago, how much support was on the other side. Um, because far too often you're in meetings with your advisor, with professors or at conferences, and it's all just about research, research, research. Um, and, but in that, right, and it's, so it's hard to see, and you just don't see a lot of examples of anything, uh, you know, besides research. Um, but now I realize actually there are so many internal discussions in the department about like all of these issues and inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would have been seven years ago, I would have been super 
uh, like bewildered by the amount of support there actually is um, that, that you just don't see uh, because people just don't talk about it. Um, but yeah. Which just to again make a plug is, is something that the LGBTQ resource guide can help with and, and identifying. And I know that um, uh, that's what I, 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 a goal that um, the guide is, is to have. I wanted to, uh, again, look at the, uh, the questions that um, the audience have posed and, and sort of cluster a, a few, um, notably around uh, a stigma or bias. And um, Professor Thomas, you mentioned being stigmatized and you, 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 you said, you know, what am I supposed to do with that? And I thought, you know, yeah, what are you supposed to do with that as you're, you know, navigating these spaces? And while it's not maybe external bias, uh, Professor Smith, you did talk about imposter syndrome and, and, and in some ways an internalization of, of maybe biases. And I, I wondered if you each could um, talk about that and, and navigating those experiences. And maybe um, uh, if you have an example that you can share, uh, that, that would uh, be great. So just to circle back to you know, me disclosing, I think that it's evolved since I came in as a postdoc where I was afraid of the power inequality and me disclosing and me getting collaborations and me being able to stay and become a faculty member. And as you move up the food chain a little bit, I'm still a you know, baby professor. I have a little less fear of repercussions of me coming out. And so, I'm more open to disclosing the fact that I'm transsexual, transgender, and I'm also a lesbian woman that I wouldn't before. But, you know, outside that, I still fear for my physical safety. You know, when you walk down the street, is it going to be okay? There's still in New York City every year, people that are killed for being transgender. I'm also an elite cyclist and there are ramifications for me racing as a transgender woman. And if I disclose in one area of my life, it opens up other areas of life. And so I've been you know, the victim of troll campaigns on Instagram saying that it's not fair that this person's racing with us. And you know, other people being called transgender as well, you know, kind of as a slight invalidates also other transgender women. But to answer your question, I do disclose in times where I think that it's going to help somebody else. Otherwise, if it's not really germane to somebody else's experience, then I live my life just because I think that it's not important to my academic life. Thank you so much, Professor Tana. Professor Smith or Bakhting, um, I don't know if you have a, a reaction to the question around bias, uh, again, internalized or external um, uh, experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, like um, imposter syndrome is real um, and almost every uh, graduate student and PhD student has imposter syndrome in one way, shape or form. Um, I've come to learn like almost every single PhD student has this. Um, and, you know, I've, I've come to actually define, you know, one of the, you know, major goals of a PhD program as just helping students overcome imposter syndrome and become, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, confident, independent researchers. Um, it takes a lot of forms. And I think when it, like, you know, connecting that with internalized bias, I think that overcoming imposter syndrome uh, takes courage. Um, so I, right, it, it, it takes courage. Um, and it's not just, it's, you know, obviously like, uh, you know, being LGBTQ can, can very tightly uh, relate to or connect with imposter syndrome, but so many other things can as well. 
um, e even just including not having prior experience in the field or not thinking you have enough connections, et cetera, et cetera. It takes courage to, uh, to get out there and overcome imposter syndrome. That's a skill that, uh, that you are building as part of a PhD program is being able to have the confidence in yourself that you are defining some kind of research vision or program and carrying it through all the way from, from conception to completion and being proud of what you do uh, and, and what you're doing with your life. That's a big part. Um, I think most of what I got out of the PhD was just that, that, that courage, more so than the work, the research itself, uh, actually. Um, that helped me a lot more in, in job, in interviews, um, was being able to, you know, uh, talk about stuff that I'm doing and what I'm interested in and, and, you know, and what I'm like and, um, and, and, and be, uh, excited about it so that other people could feel that energy and that excitement, that passion. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, the approach to bias has to be changing policy and laws as seen in the chat. But I think that Brian is saying it so well, there's also internal barriers as a result of internalizing that. And those are actually the ones that you have a fair amount of control over and can work on with your peers and with your mentors to, to address those. I've certainly have found that, that I had to overcome my own internal barriers to uh, progress, I guess, in my, in my work and as a person. Thank you for sharing that. And I, you know, I, I feel like confidence and, and esteem for oneself and work is, is so important in, in this field. And um, imposter syndrome can be a, a huge hindrance to that. And it's, it's something that I think we, like uh, Professor Smith said, we all deal with or have dealt with. Um, but I do think there are some particular challenges um, that LGBTQ students and faculty have with that in, in that regard. I want to again go to the chat. Uh, there are a couple of questions, and please, again, I know we're we're close to getting to our, our conclusion, but we want to make sure that uh, all class questions are answered. So continue to place them in the chat, um, and I'm going to ask two uh, at once. Um, but any uh, impact that you have felt or seen uh, with regard to some of the, the the changes that we've seen with regard to legal victories from the Supreme Court around LGBTQ. Um, issues, notably uh, gay marriage, but also um, to pivot a little bit, if you could speak to um, the experience of being a representative for your community um, and of sometimes being um, the person that has to speak on behalf of, of every uh, LGBTQ person, which obviously that umbrella term encompasses well more than one person could ever speak to, but but clearly we um, we we are put in that position. So I, I'm wondering if you could also talk a little bit about your experiences with that and, and how you um, have handled that. I think being the spokesperson is fatiguing. Um, it's a burden and a blessing. I think that it's important that there is somebody that can do it, and I think that you know when I have the mental and emotional bandwidth to do it. I love doing it, but there's some times where I'm just so exhausted where I can't do it sometimes. And I think that's where having allies that we've trained goes a long way. And I think that's really where some of the efforts like what we're doing right now, that's really what we're trying to accomplish. I can't agree more, Tiffany. It's really a a privilege to be able to do that, but you, one doesn't always feel like it. You wake up some days and then you don't want to be that spokesperson that day. Exactly, as you said. Other um, questions, please again, um, place in the chat. I guess I, I would, uh, and I think there's been so much uh, wonderful uh, advice and, and great tips and experiences that have been shared that, uh, that we can all uh, learn from. But what specifically would, uh, would you say to maybe your past self when you were a graduate student um, or when you were uh, just at the beginning of your career that would help or that would have uh, helped with regard to 
moving through this space in academia as a as an LGBTQ person. Is there anything that you would 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 do differently, or that you'd say to yourself that 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 um, you know, looking back, um, uh, you you have obviously we we get perspective when we're looking back, but anything that you might change or say to yourself as a piece of advice. I think it's the same thing that I tell myself now that you're not alone. You are enough. You're going to be okay. Words to live by. Absolutely. Others. Yeah, I like that. I think like, um, I resisted, uh, you know, that I just like, I guess I resisted a lot of things um, when I was a master's student and, and for maybe the first half of my PhD, including, you know, really, um, you know, research and personal wise, I resisted a lot of things. I like, uh, it took me a while to just start dating. It took me a while to start just like thinking up of my own research projects. I thought that like, oh, everyone else is gonna think this is a stupid idea. Um, it just took me a while to start to try things out and, and, and get that confidence and that courage. And I think I, I would tell my past self that um, uh, essentially to chill out, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, that, that, you know, that would be one, um, and, to, uh, and to just try more things. Um, I, didn't try, I didn't try enough things. I did, I always, I, I, I felt like I had my experience from undergrad where I was just kind of taking classes, trying to get good grades, not much else. Um, and I didn't really, it took me a long time to come out of my shell and to realize that uh, life is not always so uh, predefined, uh, you know, cut out, um, cut out for you. Excellent, thank you. I think what I tell myself a lot is, you know, recognize the fear, I guess, of, of something maybe that, that is a, taking a, a calculated risk and do it anyway. You know, not let that stop me from pursuing my, my next step. So I tell that to myself that if it's important, you're going to probably feel some anxiety and fear. And that's not a reason not to take that next step. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful reflections. And I think advice to your past self, but advice that certainly we can also utilize uh, uh, today. Uh, we are getting close to, to the time that we have to wrap up. And I, um, I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists. I think we could easily keep this conversation going for uh, hours, um, but um, Thanks to each of you. Thanks to um, uh, all of those who uh, participated. And I hope that we can keep this conversation going, this important conversation going. So Ishelle, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Professor Wilson. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, it was a really rich conversation and, and I appreciate you all taking the time and, um, and sharing as much of yourselves as you did. I, I know that, um, that everyone really benefited from hearing your stories. Um, I'd like now to turn it over briefly to my colleague, um, Adina Berrios Brooks, who serves as the Assistant Provost for Faculty Advancement to just say a few words about the guide that we keep talking about. It was her office that spearheaded that project. Um, Adina? Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I just quickly shared my screen um, so that everyone could see the guide on the, our website. Um, which is, you can see the URL up here <clears throat> and we'll put it in the chat. And I just wanted to say, we developed this guide um, really for everyone on this call. It was so heartwarming to hear all the stories and really to um, provide a clearinghouse and a resource for LGBTQ faculty, staff and students, but also really to highlight um, the many, um, the, so much of the amazing work that's been done across the university in this field. And I, I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Bakting uh, for leading us in this and also to Jen Leach, who's I, I know is on the call and works in my office. But one thing I wanna say about this guide is it's a first edition and that we really very much wanna hear feedback from those of you on this call. Um, on this website, there are is a form 
And if you, after you've reviewed the guide, you think, hey, there's something missing or there's something that should be maybe put a different way, please provide that feedback um, by this June. We'll be spending the summer um, incorporating that feedback and hopefully printing this guide when we're all in person and hopefully able to give each other hugs and, and do all the things that we're missing so much today. So thank you for the opportunity to do this. Great to see you all. And um, we're listening. We're here. This was a project that was um, very much aided by interviews and focus groups with students and faculty, but there is so much more that we have to hear. So please, please provide your feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adina. Um, I just want to remind everyone that, that tonight's event um, is part of the Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement, um, which is an initiative out of our office, the Office of University Life. And so this is one in a series of events um, that will be happening throughout the semester, um, really throughout the year. We start every year with a graduate um, welcome. Um, so hopefully, um, and it's for new and returning students. So hopefully um, those of you who didn't join uh, this year can join us next year. But the next event in the series for this year is an event called Assembling Your Mentoring Squad, um, where you will learn how to successfully navigate graduate school while cultivating relationships to help you plan for your future. Um, so save the date that will be on Thursday, February 11th at 4 p.m. and you can register through our office. Um, so please um, return for that event. It's sure to be enriching as well. And again, I just want to say thank you to everyone who registered, who attended, who participated, and, and a special shout out to all of our panelists. Um, again, for your rich, rich contributions tonight. Um, everyone will receive an evaluation form. Um, so please um, take a moment uh, to fill that out. We really rely on, on feedback from you all to help us grow and develop this initiative. So your, um, your feedback is an essential part of that process. Um, thank you everyone. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and um, hope to see you soon. Take care, have a great evening, bye-bye. <laughs>